Okay, we're going to look through the uh, prob and stats uh, chapter. A lot of this has been reviewed from IED, so hopefully you can we can go through it fairly quickly. Uh, the first thing we're going to look at is probability, and uh, the first thing we have here is relative uh, frequency, and the relative frequency is um, the number of times an event will occur divided by the number of opportunities. And the classic thing we do is like flipping a coin. So um, what kind of events can occur? Well, you can have uh, a head or you can have a tail. And the number of opportunities is two because there's two sides of a coin. Um, so um, we can uh, draw some uh, probability trees to try to figure out uh, certain things. So 9.1 says, what is the probability of a tossed coin landing heads up? So you can do a probability tree here. And uh, the, um, we want heads as the, as the uh, event we're, we're looking for. And then we divide that by the number of, uh, pos of uh, possibilities. We have two possibilities, the heads or the tail. So 1 over 2. And the probability of a tossed coin landing heads up is 1 half. Um, what is the probability of tossing a coin twice and it landing heads up both times? So you can toss the coin, you get either a heads or a tails. You can toss those coins again and you get a heads or tails or heads or tails again. And then um, if you want to you look at the results and how many times did we get heads up twice? Um, well, we only got it uh, right here. Out of how many possibilities? Well, out of four. So there'd be one uh, fourth uh, probability of getting that uh, possibility. Okay, um, then it gets a little more complicated when you have to get when you have to draw a really big probability tree. So, what is the probability of uh, mm, sorry about that? Um, what is the probability of tossing a coin three times that landing heads up? Um, exactly two times. Remember, it's not three times. Three times. It's exactly just two times. So we do it uh, tail head, and we do those again, and get a probability. And we do it again, and get a probability. And in the end, uh, how many times did it do heads twice exactly? Um, you got those three out of eight pop possibilities. So it was three out of eight. And you can draw these probability trees, but they're um, kind of annoying. So uh, what we can do instead is we can use what's called a Bernoulli process, a Bernoulli process. And what do we have here with the Bernoulli process? Well, we have the probability is uh, P. That's what we're trying to um, you know, get our answer and figure it out. We have X. X is the number of times for a specific outcome within N trials. So um, you know the, the uh, question, that last question says, what is the probability of tossing a coin twice, right, and it landing up, uh, landing heads up, um, no, sorry, what is the probability of tossing a coin three times, and it landing up, heads up exactly um, two times. So X, the number of times for specific outcome, that would be two, right, we want it to come up just two times, not three, not one, just twice. What's the number of trials? Well, it says we're going to toss the coin three times, so that's n. n is would be three times. What's the probability of success on a single trial? That's the probability of a coin like being ahead, and that'd be one half. And the probability of failure, which would be a, a tail, that would also be one half. And then uh, the factorial, the exclamation point is a factorial, which means you, like if I had seven factorial. That would be 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Why did I choose something so big? Okay, um, that's what it means to factorialize uh, something. That should be a button on your calculator. On mine, I have to uh, do like a shift uh, 3, I think. and it, it looked like something x factorial, so you can type in like a, a 4 do shift uh, three and that'd be four uh, factorial and you can figure that out. Okay, so uh, if you'll notice here, um, we have n factorial. So in, in this example, if I was do, doing this example, well, I think uh, we'll, we'll do it here on the next, uh, next page. Let's try to, yeah, so we got it right here, okay? So um, this is the probability of tossing a coin three times that lands heads up exactly uh, two times. So we had n factorial right here. 
was 3 times 2 times 1. Uh, then we had p to the x power, um, which is 1 half to the 2. x is the number of times that we, we need, two times we need it to be heads. And then the other, the probability of losing basically is still 1 half, but we want, and how many times do we want to lose? We want to lose actually once. Okay, so you'll notice that the 2 and the 1, they're going to always add up to the amount of uh, uh, n. They're going to add up to n every time. And then on the bottom, we have our 2 factorial and our 1 factorial. And I can do this, and I get uh, the 37.5%, which is exactly what we had um, for when we did the factorial tree. So use the Bernoulli process to uh, figure, figure things out like that. Um, let's go ahead and try this here. Let's do a problem here. What is the probability of tossing a coin seven times and it landing heads up exactly uh, three times? Okay, so um, if we write out Bernoulli's, I'm, I'm going to write out Bernoulli's again here. The probability is going to be n factorial times probability of getting what I want and probability of getting uh, not what I want, n minus n minus x all over the x factorial times the n minus x uh, factorial. Okay, so, um, and how many times, uh, how many times are we going to uh, flip the coin? We're going to do it seven times, so that's seven factorial. Uh, the probability is uh, 0.5, and how many times uh, do I want, I want it to land heads up exactly three. So that's going to be 0.5 to the three power, and what I don't want to have happen is tails, and I, went, I don't want that to happen uh, four times. So that's going to be the fourth power. And then I uh, down here, then I want three factorial, and I want uh, four factorial down there like this. Okay, So you can put that all in the calculator, and uh, if you do it, hopefully correctly, I get like 27.3% using Bernoulli's process. See, I'd rather use Bernoulli's process instead of writing out a probability tree. That would be not very good. Okay, um, so now what we want to look at is the difference between and and or. And and or. You, sometimes you'll see the word and, and sometimes you'll see the word or. If you see the word and, that means multiply the probabilities. The, the word or means you're going to add the probabilities. Okay, so if events A and B are independent, then the probability of A and B occurring is uh, probability of A and B. So you're going to multiply the probabilities. So an example here is what is the probability of rolling a 4 on a die and then a 1? Well, the probability of rolling a 4 is uh, 1 out of 6. There's 6 sides on a die, so it would be 1 out of 6. The next time I want to roll um, a 1, okay, and the probability of that is also 1 out of 6. But I want to do, I want to roll a 4 and then I want to roll a 1. So I multiply these probabilities together and I get 1 over 36, which is like a 2.7%. That's an and. If you have two things you need to have happen, you have to multiply their individual probabilities. What about an or? Okay, so here's an or. So when we have an or probability, we're going to add. If events A and B are mutually exclusive, that means it can't happen at the same time, then the probability of A and B occurring is adding their probability. So what is the probability of rolling a 4 or rolling a 1 on a single die? Well, the probability of rolling a 4 is 1 out of 6, but the probability of running a 1 is also 1 out of 6. And you want a 4 or a 1. You don't care which one it is. So you actually add them together. That's a little bit better probability. You get 2 out of 6, which is one-third or 33.3% chance that you have. And that makes sense because there's six possibilities and you're rolling a 4 or a 1. That's two of the six possibilities. That's one-third of uh, the numbers on a die. So you get a 33.3% chance. Uh, 9.7. What two cards are dealt with from a shuffled deck? What is the probability that the first card is an ace? And the second card is a face card or a 10. Okay, so this is a little, little more confusing. So what's the probability that the first card is an ace? How many, how many uh, cards are in a deck? There's 52 cards in a deck. How many aces are there in a deck? There are four. So the probability of drawing an ace is four out of 52. So that's what we want. Um, 
and, and, so we're going to multiply, we're going to multiply that probability by something, and the second card is a face card. Okay, how many face cards are there? Well, there's a, there's, there's a jacks, there's queens, and there's kings. And so there's three, and that'd be of every suit. So three times four, there'd be 12 face cards in a deck. So it'd be 12 out of 52 is the probability of drawing a face card. Now it says the second card needs to be a face card or, or a 10. So I can add the probability of drawing a 10. How many 10s are there? There's four out of 52. So um, the probability of drawing a, a face card or a 10 is actually then uh, 16 out of 50, 52, okay? But I want to multiply that by the probability of drawing a, uh, um, an ace on the first card. It's 4 out of 52. So I'm going to take 4 times uh, 16, and uh, I get uh, for that I get 64. And then 52 times 52 is 2,704. And the probability of all of this happening is 2.4%. Uh, if you want to get really good at counting cards, you need to know a lot about statistics. Okay, um, good. All right, Bayes' theorem. Bayes' theorem is the one that seems kind of complicated, but it's not actually that bad. Uh, Bayes' theorem says that um, what is the probability of A occurring if you know that it is E condition, right? What's the probability of A happening if you know that it's E condition? And what you, the way you do that is you get what's, uh, you take the probability of the condition given A, um, times the probability that it came from A. And then you do that divided by all these other things here. So this right here, you'll see this section here is the exact same as this. So you take the probability that it's a certain condition if it came from A, uh, times the probability that it came from A, divided by uh, the same thing here, plus the probability of that condition if it came from B, times the probability that it came from B, plus the probability of that condition if it came from C, times the probability that it came from C. So this looks still confusing, but if you look at this problem, LCD screen components for a large cell phone manufacturing company are outsourced to three different vendors. So vendor A, B, and C make all these LCD screens. Okay, but vendor A, 60% um, uh, of the LCD screens we get from vendor A. 30% from vendor B and 10%, we don't get a whole lot of LCD screens from vendor C, okay? That, that this is the probability that they, that they came from those particular things. So if I picked a random LCD screen out of the manufacturing floor, um, there's a 60% chance it came from A, 30% chance it came from B, and a 10% chance it came from C, okay? Now, quality control experts have determined that 0.7% of vendor A's LCD panels are defective. They're pretty good. They're pretty good. Only 0.7%. Uh, vendor B, probably why we're using mostly vendor A, right? Probably that's probably why we're going to use mostly vendor A. 1.4% of the LCD panels we get from vendor B are defective, okay? And then 1.9% of vendor C components are uh, defective. That's probably why we're using uh, only 10% of them. You're getting 10% from vendor C. Okay. So uh, defective is really what we're going to have B for. Uh, e. So this first uh, question says, if a cell phone is randomly chosen, a cell phone is randomly chosen, what is the probability that the LCD screen on that cell phone was produced by vendor A if it was a defective LCD screen? What's the chances that it came from A if it's defective? Okay. Now, you'll see, what's the chance that it's just from vendor A? Well, it's 60%, right? 60%. But what is the chance that it came from vendor A if it was defective? Right, so this probability up here says, okay, and, and A and B and C are going to be really good to use here because that's kind of what we call vendors A, B, and C. Now maybe we'd put in a D for defective instead of for E. That might be a little bit make it a little easier. But this is saying, what is the probability that it came from A if it is defective? How do we do that? Well, we we use this. So this says, write down what is the probability that it's defective if it came from A. What's the probability that it's defective if it came from A? All right, so we're going to start doing this uh, problem here. Um, so um, it's, it's actually not that bad. It's not nearly as bad as it looks. What, right here, what's the probability that it's defective if it came from A? Well, we know that. It is 0.7%. 
So I can do 0.7 right there times the probability that it came from A, that's 60%, okay? All over um, right here, what's that? The that's the same as this up here, right? Probability that it's defective it came from A, that was 0.7, times the probability that it came from A, that was 60%, right? Plus the probability that it's defective if it came from B, what was that? Well, that is 1.4%, times the probability that it came from B, that is 30%, plus the probability that's defective if it came from C, which is 1.9%, uh, uh, times the probability that came from C, which was uh, 10%. And if I do this, all this calculation, I already did that, I got like, uh, um, this was like 42, 42 on the top, 42 on the top, and on the bottom it was 103, okay? Which ends up being like 40.8%, uh, okay? So there's a 40.8% chance that it is defective if it, uh, if it came from A. Now, now watch, if, if you just randomly picked an LCD screen, what's the chance that it came from A? Well, it'd be 60%, right? But if it's if it, uh, what's the chance that it uh, came from A if it's defective? That's actually only 40.8%. It's actually lower percent than if I just randomly pulled out an LCD panel and figured out what they are at A. Now, uh, the, the next two questions here, that I'm not going to scroll down, but the next two questions you'll see in your book are trying to figure out what is the probability if it came from B if it was defective and what's the probability if it came from C that it was defective. And I figured those out already. Um, if it came from B, it's actually uh, the same thing. It's 42 over 103. This is for B. It's also 40.8%. Now, what's the probability that you just randomly select an LCD panel and it was from B? Well, that was 30%, right? So if it's defective, then that percentage C goes up, right? So if, it's, if you randomly pulled out an LCD panel, there should be a 30% chance that it came from B. But if you randomly pull out an LCD panel and it's defective, now it goes up to a 40.8% chance that it's from B, right? That's because B is uh, making more defective parts than, than A is that, as a percentage, okay? Now, if you figured out um, coming from C, uh, you ended up getting, um, you ended up getting, uh, let's see, what was it? It was 18.4 uh, over uh, 103, because the bottom's never going to change, right? The bottom's not going to change for these problems. And that ends up being um, uh, 18, uh, it wasn't 18.4. I don't remember what it was on the top. I'm not sure what it was on the top. But anyway, it came out to be 18.4%. So if the probability that it comes from C and it's, def and it's defective is 18.4% chance, okay? Now that's pretty bad because uh, if you just randomly pulled out an LCD panel and said, hey, what's the chance that it came from, uh, came from vendor C? It's only 10% chance. But if you say you pull one out and say, this is defective, now what's the chance that it came from vendor C? It's actually all the way up to 18.4% chance. Right, because what's vendor C? Vendor C is making almost two percent defective parts, right? Okay, so that's Bayes' theorem. Um, any problems you're going to get on the eLab or actually on the Jedi trial are going to be exactly like these. In fact, I'm actually going to use LCD screen components from vendor A, B, and C. I'll give you some different numbers, but uh, you need to know basically how to do exactly uh, this type of a problem. Okay. Um, and there's, uh, there's it kind of steps you through there on how to do everything that I just showed you. Okay. Um, okay. And, uh, good. That'll all work. And then you did 9.9, 9.10. Okay. Um, then we do statistics and this, uh, should be a big review. Um, central tendency, uh, we have mode is the most frequent occurring value. We have the median is the value that occurs in the middle. Um, the range is the difference between the minimum and the maximum, and of course the mean is the, the average. Um, you should know how to calculate all those things. Uh, standard deviation, uh, you should know how to calculate that also. There's a really long process to do, uh, but I also put a video um, in this 
playlist on showing you how to do that on your calculator, and I would recommend that you do it that way. Okay, so um, here's something to practice with. Um, if you calculate the, um, the mean of this, if you put it on your calculator, you can uh, have it calculate the mean for you, but um, the mean, which is normally um, um, like mu, um, I got a mean of like 47.6, so you want to check yourself on this. Uh, the mode would be um, which one occurs the most, and that would be the 63, so it would be 63. Um, the median would be the one that's in the middle, right? So I could do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I could do 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and there it is right there. The median is a 58. And the range would be the biggest one minus the smallest one. So the range would be uh, 61. Um, and then the standard deviation, I use the calculator for that. I, I, I would recommend you figure out how to do that on the calculator. Um, remember, you can get the standard deviation for the whole population, or you can get the standard deviation n minus 1 of a, just a, of a sample. Um, I got 21.4 and I got 22.4 for the standard deviations for, for those particular problems. So you should check your work on those, on how to uh, do those. Okay. Histograms, we divide up into bin intervals and uh, you know try to see if we get normally distributed curves. A normal distributed curve is like a bell curve like this. And there's called the empirical rule, if you remember that from ID. And the empirical rule says that if you have the mean right here at the at the you know at the at the uh, middle section here, and you go up, calculate your standard deviation. If you go up one sigma or down one sigma, one standard deviation, that 68 or basically 70 percent of your data shelf should fall within plus or minus one standard deviation above and below your mean. That's this is the, called the empirical rule, and you should know this. This is important. Okay, if you do two standard deviations, you get like 95%. 95% of your data would be plus two standard deviations or minus two standard deviations above the mean. And if you do three standard deviations, uh, you basically get almost all of it, 99.7%. Almost all your data should fall within three standard deviations of the mean. That's the empirical rule. We asked a lot of questions about that in IED, and you're going to get more questions about it in POE. So hopefully that uh, kind of uh, gives you a brief overview of the statistics and you can uh, do uh, the, uh, uh, the ELAB and uh, be able to be successful on the JEDI trial.